Zondra International once again presents the Remarkable Women Powerful Stories webinar series. And I welcome you to my conversation today with Jane Milburn, OAM. I'm Lynn Foley and I'm truly privileged to speak with, you, with the remarkable women who are so generous with their stories and with their time. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also pay that respect to First Nations people present. Zondra International is a leading global organisation working together to build a better world for women and girls. Jane, I warmly welcome you to our conversation today. As we Thank begin, you for having I'll, me. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure and um, the pleasure of our audience today. And so I'll just give a really short introduction uh, to you and your achievements. However, most of those will get revealed during our conversation. But I know that um, you did an agricultural study and leadership study early in your career and had a, had a brilliant career in rural communications and advocacy. And now you have this really unique pathway to influence change in the way we dress. As the founder of Textile Beat and the author of Slow Clothing, finding meaning in what we wear. So I don't think I'll say much more than that because I think I'd like to reveal that during our conversation. But one of uh, Jane's most recent achievements, of course, is her Churchill Fellowship. And during the conversation, for those who are not uh, familiar with Churchill Fellows, I know that uh, Jane will give us a great explanation of that. And also was uh, awarded very recently the a Medal of the Order of Australia for her service to fashion sustainability in 2022. I wonder if that might make us um, equivalents or something, Jane, both having had the honour of an OAM here on, in the Australian Honours List. But indeed, that is a fabulous honour. So congratulations, because that's very recent. Mm, thank you. Okay, so your life and career have many significant milestones to celebrate so far. I'm wondering where, you, where your story began and what from those early years influenced your choice of study into ag science, agricultural science, I should say. Yeah, well, um, my story began in um, the South Island of New Zealand in a place called the Catlands. I grew up on a sheep farm there yeah. and um, it was an extended family situation. My great grandma lived with us and she was of Naitahu and Pākehā extraction. So I think that's where a lot of my earthy based philosophy um, comes from. And uh, we moved to Australia uh, when I was 11, mainly for education. We had a dairy farm here as well, but mostly I grew up in Brisbane. And I guess I always had that attachment to life on the land, understanding and involvement with nature. And I saw agricultural science as a pathway to do that. My mother, who was a teacher, had been encouraging me to do teaching. And um, I mean, in some ways, that's kind of where I've ended up, not necessarily formally, but, you know, I think agricultural science was a way of, um, you know, staying involved with farming. My first proper job after doing that degree was uh, as an ABC rural journalist. Mm -hmm. And so that was really just enabled me to be curious and finding out about food and fibre production and where our food and fibre comes from. That's interesting. And for our international uh, audience, uh, ABC radio and television here in Australia is a national broadcaster, so it's a, it's a quintessential, isn't it, media outlet, I guess, mm, in Australia. Mm, so, yes, yes. And, and very big on the rural journalism and uh, in promoting and telling stories from mm. rural Australia. Mm, yes. So, so in, having moved into rural communications and advocacy down the track a little bit, how did that help you develop your advocacy skills? Because as I understand it, and having heard you speak at our recent Zonta conference, um, advocacy is more or less your passion these days, along with many mm. other passions. So how did that um, time as a journalist and working in rural communications develop that skill set, do you think? Well, everything that we do sort of, um, leads to who we are really and, and what we can achieve and our understanding of the way, um, you know, I guess communication happens and how the potential for change can happen. Um, I um, 
developed what was called a portfolio career after I met my husband Darcy at the Forsyth Rodeo up in uh, in Cape York <laughs> at the bottom of Cape York Peninsula yeah. and um, because he's a, he was exploring you know his work is exploring for gold and minerals um, he was he had to go away a bit so once we had children I needed to be more available so I did jobs where I could take school holidays and do all of that. And in hindsight, that gave me uh, a fabulous package of skills. I worked um, for a minister for one time when Darcy, his mother, lived with us and um, she was not well and Darcy um, stayed at home while I was able to reactivate my communications career. But I I worked in newspapers um, doing communication for university um, and working for a minister for primary industry, which was really valuable. And then I developed a consultancy which um, enabled me to take on clients. I advocated for the Australian Banana Growers Council around Mm -hmm. an issue that was important for them about keeping pests and diseases out of Australia. So when countries wanted to import bananas, we we made a major campaign around science, public awareness, um, legal aspects Mm -hmm. and political. So I got a great insight from that and I worked for Diabetes um, Queensland on uh, public Mm -hmm. awareness and various issues. And Mm -hmm. I did win some awards along the way, but I I think the main thing that possibly we'll we'll talk about later is um, a place on the Australian Rural Leadership Program, which was really a gift about more insight into self. You know, you can never really Mm -hmm. know enough about yourself and and how you respond to things, how you interact with other people. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the advocacy really was just came from me um, just speaking about what I believed in, you know, from a place of values. So even though we might have been going to speak about that later, maybe I'll take you into that space now about the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation and the fellowships and that program because it's a well-known program here in Australia. So can you just give a short explanation of what its intention is and a little bit more about your experience there, Jane? Well, it's it's a gift. Uh, it, it's a gift of, in my day, it was 60 days of personal and professional development. And each of the positions are sponsored um, by, um, funded up to 50,000 it was back then. And it enables you to, in, I talk about investigating self and interacting with others. And um, it's a safe space where you can play at, understanding your leadership potential and what matters. And we um, we travelled to lots of different um, locations as well. We got to go overseas to India and um, and we started in the Northern Territory where, you know, we, we were understanding about the First Nations perspective and that was really a valuable insight into really the longevity of everything, you know, and how the role that we play today in our little time on the planet, Mm -hmm. you know, and how that can interact in a bigger picture. So I I guess I, one of the things I really understood from the leadership program is that I'm a creative, innovative thinker and doer. And, um, and that's why I guess I I love working with people and I recognise being part of a team is a fabulous opportunity because the power of the team is bigger than the individuals. But in this case, with the work that I went on to do after that, you know, I realised that, um, you know, I had my own independent voice and I needed to use it. I didn't, you know, you, you can consult with far too many people or be restricted by certain perspectives you know the commerce the machine of commerce often restricts us Um, also traditional power structures within organizations sometimes Mm -hmm. restrict us so I guess it set me free in a way and I can remember an experience in ARLP that was really quite telling in hindsight because we get we get to play leader, you know, play leader on a certain day. And this was in the Kimberley and we were blindfolded and we needed to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I was the leader. And 
I actually failed to lead because I just thought, oh, this is just fun. And I didn't recognise the leadership opportunity. And that was a profound reflection for me as a sense of having, you know, I guess in that instant I failed to deliver, I failed to see the leadership potential. (laughs) And so I think that's what happened down the track where I see, well, there's a leadership opportunity here to stand up and speak about a different way of dressing in that case that's what I needed to do you know to go against Mm. what convention dictates and just say well this is what I do and I'm actually speaking from an authentic perspective in that it's as um, one of my the people I met on my Churchill Fellowship and I've followed for a long time Dr Sass Brown she's Mm. she referred to me as a slow fashion practitioner and I guess (laughs) I just practice that in life and I've had a unique opportunity to kind of Mm. take that learning around values and ethics that we we learned from the leadership program and apply it to to my work which is great and it's uh I've, I've met many women who've been part of I didn't have a chance to do that I've done other <coughs> leadership programs of a similar yeah, type lots of great ones very around mm. lots of fabulous but so many women from rural Australia have been and I've mm. had women work with me when I worked corporate and in government uh, from that program and they talk um, as you do with so much excitement about the opportunity to learn about oneself and to yes, really grow. It's so rare. And it's so rare. Mm. It is rare to, to find yourself in a group of other, and it's a mixed group, isn't it, men and women? Yes, yes, yes from all different walks of life too. Yes, mm. It is. It's amazing. So with mm. that in mind, you introduce your website, Textile Beef, with every day we eat and we dress, We are now more conscious of our food. It's time to be more conscious of clothing. I'm wondering how you found your way to that slow clothing philosophy. You've already talked a little bit about how that came off your advocacy and the need to find your voice and the power of a voice. But how Mm -hmm. else did you come to that and becoming that strong advocate for, I think I've heard you describe it as, a holistic and sustainable approach to dressing? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was doing values-based leadership and enjoying that, but I had a clash of values over something, you know, I'd created something innovative within a workplace and I really was not able to implement it in the way that um, I intended or that would enable it to fly. And in the end, it fell apart when I left. Mm -hmm. But I kind of felt I had to leave Um, and that coincided with um, a third child finishing school and, you know, a a reduction in the need to earn income. Mm -hmm. So I was doing some further leadership study, a bit more navel gazing if you like, you know, and (laughs) I actually went back to those assignments when I was researching Mm -hmm. my answers Mm -hmm. to some of your questions and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just felt... um, that uh, I, I could was observing a change in the. I went to a Fashion for Flood fundraiser in 2011, and at the end of the night, everything was marked down. I bought a few more expensive items, but um, at the end of the night, I was able to buy 30 sh- shirts, tops for $60. And um, it really led me to think, what is going on here with all all these beautiful clothes? There's just this surplus of quality items that are just being replaced. And so it, it took me a year or two after that to have the opportunity to just reflect in my work with various farm groups. I'd followed the food story. And I just thought there's a clothing story that sits alongside that. And in a way, we're derailed by the fashion narrative, which is all about the trends and and all all of that looking good, you know, and I've I've got some things to say about that later as well. But I just thought there's there's something about the fibres. I also observed the change in the fibres in the clothes. Um, Two-thirds of our clothing is synthetic. And it wasn't until I started researching this topic that I realised that I could see the change 
And then, of course, the Rana Plaza factory collapsed in 2013 mm. when I was doing this leadership study. And I thought, you know, it's just more compelling to take a different approach. So I just sort of bobbed up and I utilised my communication skills and um, developed a campaign for 2014 called mm. So It Again. So I was upcycling and blogging every day, doing things differently. And I had a wonderful opportunity to talk about that on, on our national broadcaster on ABC Radio. And, you know, I just said, well, I wear secondhand clothes and I sew. And it felt a bit risky to be saying that, really. In fact, my husband said to me, why are you throwing away your career? And I actually felt I was adding, I was utilising everything that I was to talk about something that I thought was important and I'm still talking about it a decade later. Mm. And there's been, you know, so much more awareness now. Um, so I feel, you know, really that, oh, I don't know, I just I feel as if I. it's still important to keep talking about it mm. and there's a lot more change to come. But when you just reflect on, on, you know, it was that stepping up, it was that awareness that I had skills knowledge insights to be able to say things differently and I've been fortunate to find an audience and speak to the Zonta <laughs> conference for example you know to be invited by various groups to to talk about what is what seems like a bit of a foreign concept but to me when I think back to growing on the farm with you know my ancestors and I just think well it's it's just what we need to be doing is respecting the resources valuing natural fibres and not indulging in this waste party. You know, if we just cut the waste of textiles, mm -hmm. we'll be doing well. And food as well, of course. It's interesting, isn't it, that so much, um, I think, around the world and I'm sure in most countries, uh, we talk so much about waste and, of course, in our country, the language is war on waste. We have so much waste mm -hmm. in. And then we worry about the recycling, we worry about the scrunchable um um, shrink wrap for all of the things mm -hmm. plastic mm -hmm. and we worry about the microfibers that are, are, are put in with natural fibers in our clothing what I've discovered even since uh, hearing you talk for the first time was when you look to try and buy clothing that is pure natural fiber it's a challenge mm -hmm. you know you look mm -hmm. at, at the clothing and I'm, I'm looking for a couple of things at the moment and I think okay I'm going to try and do this in linen or in cotton or but something that is unadulterated, if you like, by other fibre, mm. other, mm. Um, oh, what's the word, synthetic fibres, and it's really hard to find that. So it's a really interesting piece about the the need for the fashion waste, the amount we waste through fashion to get as much of a headline as maybe the food and packaging. I, I don't know what you think, but I think it needs to be there equally. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, food is um, represents 20% of our carbon footprint in, in a general sense. And clothing fashion is probably more like 10% or less, but it's still significant. And it's the polluting aspects. And, mm. you know, what we've seen now, and it, it is what I spoke about early in the piece, that mm. only about 15% of our clothing in in Australia is sold again through opportunity shops. The rest either goes, you know, 25% to landfill, 15% becomes industrial rags, mm. and the rest is shipped offshore to mm. developing countries. And it's actually mm. sold. Although this is changing now, I think, as we've seen the polluting aspects of um, in southern parts of Africa and in the Atacama Desert in South America, you know, there's we realise that we 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 ought not do that because that is exporting our waste. It's stuff that's not suitable to be sold in our op shops. Mm. And it just struck me as being wrong. Like so there were mm. the more I investigated it, the more stuff I found to talk about. And um I I'm, I'm really quite gratified that a lot of what I have believed at the time is sort of coming true sadly and yeah. well now we're, yes. we're kind of moving to a place of change but volume remains the big issue you know we have to stop buying as much um and Absolutely. focusing on buying quality and having less of it 
So with that in mind, you mentioned a moment ago about secondhand shopping. I know you are a very, I use the word keen shopper. I think there are probably <laughs> more expansive adjectives one could use uh, for you in a vast range of secondhand clothing stores. Can you tell us more about the clothing you make for yourself? How are you influencing others to return to those sewing machines in those cupboards? Very safely mm. packed away in cupboards. And renewing that long lost or forgotten sewing skills, as well as the pre loved clothing as an option for dressing, because you've just mm. mentioned that mm. you dress in through the second hand market, as a lot of people do. Um, mm. So, yeah, can you just expand a little on that for us? Yes. Well, I, I was a very keen op shopper. Now I have to be very careful about what I buy because any sort of shopping it tends to be addictive. And mm. so I just say that, that I, I, every now and then I give myself a treat of, oh, let's go in and see what I can find there. But I have to be really careful about what I choose because we all end up with so easily with too much. Um, what I'm wearing at the moment, just out of interest to talk about that, is I have made this out of merino fabric that I bought, kind of like I guess it was a treat for myself to have um clothes in winter that are easy care to look after and it's really not it's not easy to find quality natural fibers in thrift shops anymore because mm -hmm. lots of people are buying them and recognizing the value there so mm -hmm. um, but what what I have done over time and I still wear a lot of these dresses like my my red dress mm -hmm. um, it's a red silk dress that I made from five thrifted garments and I created it just using squares and rectangles in a shape to suit myself. And I did, um, I do, it's hashtag adventures of the red dress. And I've worn that dress 55 times and probably more. They're the ones that I've documented on my Instagram. And mm -hmm. I guess I just, I love rescuing the resources that are there that other people have thrown away and seeing value. And when you've got a few skills, you can, improve improve things or make them suit yourself and I am a feminist I I need to talk about the fact though that as a feminist and having had the opportunity to go to university my mother was a home economics teacher and she went to uni as well she didn't really teach me to sew but I had the sewing machine there and you just go forwards and back and that's that I think everyone needs to go on their own sewing journey like you can do it. It's just a little bit of problem solving and a little bit of reading and researching. There's lots of easy um, pattern systems available now, which is great. But I just think until you make something with your own hands, you don't appreciate the resources, time and effort that go into the things that you buy. So, you know, we have low cost clothing so readily available. And I often look at it, it makes me feel slightly sick about you know, how can they be selling that for that amount of money when, and I know there's, um, you know, I guess benefits of uh, producing multiples, but, um, you know, it really just doesn't seem quite right that our industrial supply chain, which has a lot of mm. modern day slavery in it, really, like mm. much as we like to pretend it doesn't, it does. And mm. that's why it's cheap. So I think it sewing for yourself, even if you're not making all of your things, even just being able to mend and tweak things a bit. Oh, I don't like the way that collar fits. I wish it was shorter. When you've got a few skills, you can do that. Um, mm. And so we threw away the sewing machine and to a lesser extent the cooking um, and, you know, in our race to do professional work. And I think that's great. Everyone should have choice. But I think that there's a little place for the sewing machine as well and those things that were perceived as domestic tasks are actually useful life skills, you know, and we, we need those life skills. Oh, just excuse me, I'll just um, have to <laughs> turn my phone off. Um, you know, we need those life skills and, you know, we see men back in the kitchen, like we're back in the kitchen because we recognise making things from scratch when we can, using fresh ingredients is actually healthy. And I would draw the same analogy with our clothing, that there's a certain place for us having, at the very least, the ability to use a needle and thread and sew on a button, take the hem up for ourselves, um, do those things. And sadly, you know, those skills have skipped at least one, if not two generations of people. So I guess that's the thing. And, and the other aspect to it is 
There's an, a human ecologist in Australia, Professor Stephen Boyden, who's written a book called The Bio Narrative. And in that, he talks about how we have psychosocial needs once our basic needs are met. We've got psychosocial needs. And one of those is doing things with our hands, the opportunity to work with our hands. And this is where sewing, cooking and gardening and all those all those things come in handy, like they actually make us feel good. And we recognise that during COVID. So working with our hands and then opportunities for creative activities and creative behaviour, which when you engage with your wardrobe and you, um, you know, you start thinking about the potential rather than following what other people think is important, you know, when when you investigate that, that is actually, um, it's very satisfying. And, you know, like traditionally in the past, you think about circular wardrobes, you know, clothes were handed around through mm-hmm. families and adapted and so on. And, you know, I, I just think doing that is fantastic. We don't need to buy and toss. There are lots of other ways we can engage with our clothes and feel like they've got memory and meaning then, you know, if they belong to someone else or, you know, in my case, if I've made it myself and I love it and I think, well, I just need to be fixing that up to keep it going longer Mm -hmm. and and you value things and Mm -hmm. they're kind of unique for you and I guess it just brings meaning and makes it special rather yeah. than um, seeking a label you know and wanting to wear something for reasons of status and looks mm-hmm. you lose the opportunity to be creative and mindful through your own actions and that's been created by branding hasn't it all the way through yeah, marketing oh so marketing it's, 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 oh let's not go there, there. <laughs> you know that whole <laughs> consumption society mm. it is but anyway, we come all the way back to the hashtag adventures of the red dress. How do we have how do we have something that um, goes through? My little piece that I've been contemplating lately is shoes. And uh, my daughter and I talk about shoes an awful lot. And, and if we talk about being a feminist and clothing and add shoes to the mix, many of us have now started to re- to wear really nice dresses or pants and top about sneakers and really comfortable shoes. And you'll see women everywhere in the loveliest dress with really nice white sneakers or whatever and that's become a real thing and it's interesting how uh, the other night I wore, I did something like that at a meeting I was at and some other women around my age group find it a little bit confronting that it doesn't seem right to do that and I said look mm. it's long past the time where we might want to have comfortable feet as well as a comfortable body so oh, it's a really, really interesting shift isn't it? Yeah, I've I've never worn high heel shoes. I've never managed to make them work. So I guess that's part of my secret rebellion, you know, like the <laughs> the most I could wear was sort of some form of platform. But I've I've never quite mastered the shoes, I have to say. Um and certainly yeah. I've found the odd ones in the thrift shop, but mostly I do invest in good shoes, good shoes. and comfortable shoes that you can walk in because we need to have an active life and that there's something about the cognitive dissonance isn't there with the stiletto it's it yeah. says something and I know people I know they make outfits look quite glamorous but they're not practical and therefore yeah. I guess they don't work for me on that level I just think yeah. it's it's yeah, yeah it's, I, what I don't even, it's what we want as individuals so it's, it's just an interesting discussion because shoes are also uh, in the disposable fashion industry, very disposable, very uh, not circular economy, et cetera, too. Yes. So I think there's a time coming. So, so let's move on. Your Churchill Fellowship, uh, gain, gaining a Churchill Fellowship is an incredible honour. A lot of work to gain it and then a lot of work to engage in it. Can you give us mm-hmm. um, just a, a couple of snippets from your time uh, on your fellowship? I know it got a little bit interrupted during the COVID space. But, mm-hmm. um, what were some of the... I guess the outcomes or the wow moments for you during that time and maybe a little description for our audience about what it actually is. Mm. Well, the Churchill uh, Fellowships were uh, run by the Winston Churchill Trust, so they were set up to honour um, Winston Churchill and they enable people from Australia to travel overseas for two months to learn and explore a topic that they're passionate about. So it's a very competitive process. You have to make a pitch 
And um, mine was to um, investigate the way that being more hands-on with our clothes, <laughs> how that can help reduce textile waste and enhance well-being. So um, I was lucky enough to, I, I went to like countries, to the US, the UK and New Zealand. I had wanted to go to Japan and Europe, but it just didn't seem practical in the circumstance. One of my personal satisfactions was that I actually overcame my fear and drove in America on the other side of the road. And that <laughs> enabled me to get out in the country and meet some fabulous people. But um, just to set the scene, one of the people I met in New York was um, Associate Professor Otto von Busch from um, Parsons School of Fashion in New York. And I'd like to read something from my Churchill report, which is available at the Churchill Trust website, churchilltrust.com.au, and also from textile from my website, textilebeat.com. You can um, download it for free. I've uh, interviewed 55 people around the world. And um, also I recorded interviews with them and they're available on my uh, on YouTube, Jane Milburn, if you want to find out more about Otto. But just to read something he said <laughs> is that fashion thrives on people's uncertainties and anxieties. It needs people to not feel good about themselves to come back next season and buy new clothes, otherwise they lose their market. He said, fashion consumption today is so user-friendly, low-cost and accessible that, you know, we're a little bit lazy and we're compliant with the um, current arrangement of things. But he said that everything is just a click away and, of course, that becomes the easiest way to engage with the world. So people think, why would I need to learn other skills then? And he thinks that this produces more alienation and traps us where we become dependent on the freedom that our money buys us, rather the freedom of our own agency to do things ourselves. And that's really important. Yeah. Um, and he also went on to say that, you know, we've all got clothes sort of dying in the back of our wardrobe, things we're holding on to. We don't necessarily want to let go of them, but they don't work for us at the moment. And when we've got a few skills, that can be what we use as resources because anyone who has been a sewist in the past would know that it's more expensive to go and buy fabric and a pattern and then invest time learning, doing, finishing it off um, than it is to go and buy something new. And that's what's got us in this dilemma. So he's feeling that our clothes are a way that we can um, research and play to our own satisfaction. And I met a lot of people who were doing that. Uh, it's called co-design or redesign mm -hmm. or refashion. Um, and it's actually what I've been doing. So I found it really affirming to do that. And even if you don't sew, there are other ways, like Amy Default is just um, going to the thrift shop and buying white garments that she likes the look of, and then she dyes them. Um, and that's how she has discovered her creativity. <laughs> Another person suggested just going to your wardrobe and styling yourself based on how you feel that day, what your intuition says, oh, well, I can wear that pink with that, and playing in the wardrobe, you know, like, and in a way everything I'm doing is it's kind of playing, but it's playing with the purpose mm -hmm. um, to reduce our need to go out and buy more stuff and work with what we've got and mm -hmm. having a few skills is essential to that so um mm -hmm. yeah it was really affirming to be able to go and meet and now my job is really just to continue sharing that message um yep. and it was great um in the UK I met a couple of um PhD repair mending type people and um, I saw that um, Kate Seckles from New York and these other two that I met in London were having a little powwow in London and it was so exciting to see them there sharing you know the message that we're, we're all agreed on that you know getting involved a little bit and mending as a minimum really does enable you to think differently. It's the start of a thinking process um, mm -hmm. for changing the way that you engage with your clothes. I have, just as a matter of interest, I have a pile of clothes sitting here on the table and my sewing machine's out and about waiting for me and there's a lot of mending and um, 
changing the shape you know recently I've lost some weight so nothing fits nicely so Mm -hmm. how can I how can I remedy that so that it will work for me so yes that's on my agenda for the next few days that's exciting exciting. (laughs) and and the thing the what but what it plays to which is something else I did learn on my fellowship um is it's privilege. Like we actually mm. still are privileged. You've got privilege to have the mm. some skills and a sewing machine and to be able to leave them out somewhere so you can do a little bit when time allows. Mm. You know, you've got the privileged realisation that we need to do things differently mm. and time is a big factor and sometimes the time is the limiting factor for people. So I guess it's just always being attuned to where the opportunities lie and just using you doing something different when you can probably rather than having a sense of guilt about it but it's all about regenerating agency and that's what that really was a conclusion of my fellowship that you know we all can regenerate our agency in in the wardrobe in some way and um and it's very satisfying when you're able to master it absolutely so and your OAM your medal of the order of Australia last year that flowed on and it is about um, um, a recognition of your service to fashion sustainability. So how did you feel? We all have individual oh. feelings of that time. How did you feel at that time? It's it's a great honour, <laughs> as you'd know, too. You know, it's, it's an honour to get that sort of uh, recognition because it's something that you you can't you can't buy it you can't win it you can't really I guess you do earn it in a way but you have to be nominated and that has to be affirmed by other people so I found it personally really satisfying Lynn because I guess with my work I deliberately have taken a pathway that has meant that I'm not necessarily earning a lot of money out of what I'm doing you know I don't have Mm. that financial reward Mm. and um I just um if you if you start to spend less you need to earn less and then you can follow your heart really and what matters Mm. to you and work with meaning and purpose so that's what I chose to do after the um Lily finished school and Mm. I didn't need to prioritize earning money so in a way that's a bit of privilege as well but you know I guess I've done without and in a way the OAM is a beautiful gift at the end of that that you don't expect Mm. but you know people people notice I guess what you're doing Mm. and nominate it is about it is about how how people notice what you're up to in amongst all of this and all of your achievements you became a trained permaculture teacher Mm. so what are your perspectives there about how that helps us care for our planet it's really important and, um, yeah, the, I did the permaculture. I first heard about it when I was at uni, of course, but I did the permaculture course because I couldn't travel and we could still move around in Brisbane. So it's 16 Saturdays is what it took. Permaculture was developed by Australians 50 years ago in response to industrial agriculture and a book called, uh, you know, like Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, you know, people were suddenly really concerned about the chemicals and the use of resources that were going, The you know, modern, uh, you know, modern farming, although, you know, like they're often moving towards more regenerative practices now, but permaculture is a design system. It's based on ethics of earth care, people care, mm. fair share, and then there are beneath that there are design principles that you can apply in whatever way is is appropriate so it's very much applies across life really some of the ones that I realized I was looking at were you know produce no waste and creatively use and reuse natural you know resources and observe and interact like these were all the principles that I was already applying in my work Um, so that was a great insight but it does apply across life and I have to say that one of my favorite interactions was with Professor Kate Fletcher in um, the UK she's a leading researcher she coined the term slow fashion 20 years ago but now she recognizes there's such a need for more profound change than what we've been able to achieve 
And part of that is new learning, like we need new learnings um, around fashion. And I read her, her PDF, um, her and a colleague wrote Earth Logic, a fashion action research plan. And if you Google Earth Logic, you can download their PDF for free. And I'm reading away in the copy that she gave me about the new learning. And bingo, turns out it it is based on the ethics of permaculture, earth care, people care, fair share. And she quoted the Australians. And so here we have now industrial fashion. The response to that is permaculture actions, you know, where we take care and engage more and do what we can, working with earth-based, caring for people, all of that, and not having excess um, and waste. So um, I, I just think permaculture applies across life. Um, and I'd, I'd encourage everybody to read a little bit about it and utilise what they can um, within the framework that they've got. Lovely, thank you. Um, so somewhere in the middle of all of your work in this fashion sustainability space and permaculture, you authored your book, Slow Cut Clothing, Finding mm. Meaning in What We Wear. What's the key message or two that when somebody picks that book up and reads that you intend them mm. to get? Yeah, well, I guess um, I've got a copy here. Um, yes. What do I really say? It's um, in a near, well, look, I, I won't read the back of it. I mean, the bottom line is that it's it's up to us to take actions and choices that reduce our material footprint. That's really like I build a case for why we need to change and we've talked about a lot of that. Yes, we have. And so um, everyday practice is what it is. It's every choice that we make makes a difference. We don't need to throw out our whole wardrobe that we've already got because we can't buy our way out of the problems. It's actually just using what we've got to hand. And what I propose really is a thinking process um, and a, a 10 point, I've got a 10 point slow clothing manifesto, I've called it. Mm -hmm. um, and the first item, first line in that is thinking more, just thinking before mm -hmm. we buy, like, do I need mm -hmm. it? Um, you know, how many times am I going to wear it? Does the price make sense? Um, will it fall apart? You know, will I get lots? Well, yeah, anyway, so thinking more and making ethical choices is a big one. Um, and then we've got natural fibres, seeking natural fibres wherever we can. We need some synthetics, um, swimsuits, for example. I, I have tried wool and I loved wool, but I didn't get the longevity out of wearing wool in the ocean and the swimming pool that I had hoped. So I've gone back to Lycra there. So we need some, but it's just being careful about Mm. What whereas at the moment two thirds of everything is yes. synthetic and it's often yeah. blended as well, so it's hard to extract and make circular down the track. Um, buying quality because quality remains after the price is forgotten, and that's a key thing. If all we do is buy quality and have fewer items of them, which is the fourth thing in the main in the manifesto, and um buying local, supporting local where you can because that reduces the, the footprint, you know, when it doesn't have to travel the world three times. Um, caring for what we want, you know, for, for what we have, that's really important and making mending and washing less, trying to wash less. That's the thing about natural fibres too. You don't have to wash them after every wear like you often do when the synthetics because they get a bit smelly and you're sweating them more. Yeah. And then the other actions are, making if you if the if you if you're more interested in becoming active you can make some clothes you can thrift and revive things um adapt them where you're upcycling which is probably the extreme end of my wardrobe where I've mm -hmm. sort of cut up and make things and then it's salvaging what you can when it's no longer suitable as clothes I have a lot of single-use rags that I use mm -hmm. that are pieces stuff that I've cut up um mm -hmm. And um, and then also, if you've got natural fibres, you can um, put them into your compost and, you know, use yeah. them where you might use straw mulch. You can put clothing yeah. down. It's yeah. surprising how quickly um, it breaks down and returns to carbon, nitrogen, yeah. hydrogen, oxygen. So, you know, you've got that 
natural cycle happening. So I just think it, it was a, a sort of a here's something different, you know, this is my narrative, uh, this is the way I do things and, um, yeah, it's interesting to see that and it's actually just taking what part of it works for you. I, I don't have all the answers. I'm just saying, well, this is what I think, <laughs> yes, you know. And, and we and we grow and, it from there, don't we, Jane? We yes, each person can yeah, grow. And you've from got there. to make it work, you know, for you. It's it's what works for you. Absolutely. I just noticing the time, so I'll move oh, yes. um, a little perhaps more quickly through the rest of our, the questions I have for you today. What do you think your leadership powers are? Your leadership powers and gifts. What do you think is the top oh, one? Or look, two? Um, when when I think about my values, I did write something down pertaining to this. Um, you know. My values are um, authenticity, creativity, autonomy and purpose. And mm -hmm. I think um, I'm a little bit of a risk taker as well, you know. I'm sort of slow to process but, I'm, uh, you know, I've got a certain amount of courage just to sort of stand out there. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, yeah, my leadership power, well, I, don't, I don't actually, I guess I've just... I just use what I have, you know, that's definitely what I do. I think a lot. I I like to hear other opinions and then I'm able to justify my own. I say, well, you know, like this is what I think. So mm -hmm. I, I've found voice around this particular issue, but it really applies across life. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know what else I can, maybe I keep it short, just leave it there. <laughs> That's lovely, and it's the power of the voice. I guess the theme I've heard through everything you've said with me today is the power of the voice, lifting mm. your voice about the things that matter to you. And mm. if people want to follow or or um, come on board or agree, then that's a bonus. But it's having that yes. voice for what you care about. That's yes. the theme I've heard. I'd reflect that back yes. to you as the theme I've oh, heard. Oh, lovely. Today. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah. it's lovely. So how do you think... Um, when you've faced life challenges, what is it that's helped you find your way through life challenges? Because so many women I work with and know ask that question, you know, how, how do other women get their way through when things go wrong or when there are disappointments or, frankly, just a big life challenge? What carries you through those, Jane? Mm. Well, um, yeah, I've, I've had a few life challenges and a, a mum died quite young um, mm. uh, and um, I, I was 22 and mm. uh, she died of bowel cancer. So uh, I guess when I had my own, and, and that was difficult, but I guess I we kept going for her really, for what mm. she'd done. And I think it's always looking at the horizon, like taking the learning from any situation and continuing to move forward and and always look for the positive. I think that's really important. Um, but after I had my own um, breast cancer scare, um, which was diagnosed very early, but I realised that, you know, suddenly you start reading research about alcohol and cancer. And so I realised, well, I've got to change my behaviour there, you know, and so I haven't drunk alcohol since I, I gave up before we did the Kimberley experience on the Australian Rural Leadership Program. So that's why I know when it happened. And also to be a good role model for our children, you know, we're, we're trying to teach them about moderation and, and all of that. So when you, you know, like not that I was drinking during the day or anything, but you're often in the evening mm -hmm. you're there and I just think it's the wrong message. So mm -hmm. I think it's... Um, it's actually a time for reflection when things go a bit pear-shaped and taking the learning and continuing to move forward. Um, when I was researching this, I went back on some of my assignments that I had the opportunity to do in my leadership postgrad, mm -hmm. and, and it was great to, to see. I think, oh, wow, I navigated that really well. I think it's just being kind to yourself as well mm -hmm. and just thinking, well, none of us are perfect what what am I good at and what can I take forward? Um, that's probably just how I deal with it, not dumping on yourself and thinking. And 
the other trap is comparing yourself with others. You know, I try yeah. not do that. I mean, all of us are susceptible to it, but it's actually realizing your own gifts and finding them because we've all got them. It's and then applying them to what you want to go forward with, and and naming them, being able to confidently name those gifts and name um, what it is that we have that's uniquely ours. And and yes, as women, sometimes we're not always confident to do that in that whole confidence space. Yeah, and I think and look, that's a really important part, isn't it? And that opportunity to learn and educate yourself and self-reflect, even if it is just doing your own research and reading books mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I think the discipline of doing formal education really does help you recognise. Mm-hmm. And see, that's where my leadership study, I think, really helped me do what I'm doing because I, I can put it in a professional framework and recognise what's happening and that that enables you to keep going, I think. Hmm, that's right. So I've got just two quick questions left. One is about, and you've been the example of this question today, the role of women in leading the approach to changes needed for a brighter future and maybe I'll put it under the whole umbrella of climate change The um, and it's broader than that, but we're looking at a sustainable world. We're looking at a sustainable planet. And I'm interested in your view of the role of women, just a short view on the role of women now and into the future. Mm. Well, we've all got lived experience of climate change now. And I think we are all, we often control a lot of the money within households. So I think wherever you spend your money is how it's the system you're building. So I think being... um, educating ourselves about what our choices are we can't do everything at once um and also there's no magic pudding I mean it really worries me about the green energy which is a great thing but then I'm talking to someone the other day who put solar on their roof early on in the piece and they're now needing to be replaced those solar panels and I said are they recyclable no no. You know, I mean, I think some of the new ones coming in might be, but, you know, there's all we've all actually got to simply use less and get more active transport instead of getting in the car all the time and minimising our footprint in whatever way we can. And as I mentioned earlier, reducing waste is a big action that we can take. So I feel it's easy to get overwhelmed, but... Um, I think we can take actions through our everyday practice and just live as simply as we can rather having expectations that we can do it all, which is kind of how we're conditioned through marketing to think that we can have it all and do it all. And it's realising that the world and the planet is finite and keeping our footprint as small as we can is really uh, an action that we can take that enables us to feel like we're doing something in the face of really what is quite confronting. And we owe it to so it's, generations. It's every person every day. Mm. Every person every day leading and doing things yeah. differently isn't, and thinking. Yes. I like your theme of thinking. So what do you think yeah. next for you, Jane? You had a lot of success so far. Oh, next? Yes, well, I mean, I'll continue this work while ever I keep getting asked to do things and keep living my values. Um, I've we've now because the children have grown up, we've um, moved to North Stradbroke Island, which is actually a really creative community, a beautiful um, step back in time in a way. There's no traffic lights here, but we're fairly close to. Um, the mainland so I can still do things but I think the next narrative is really about living simply and I'm developing we bought a beach shack and um, you know we're just developing it along permaculture lines just using what you've got and being adaptive I've dug up the front lawn and I've planted it with lots of herbs and things and I'm letting them all go to seed and enjoying gathering the seed and seeing the bees buzzing around all the time. So I think it's probably applying the principles of slow clothing across life and talking about that and, you know, recognising when new opportunities to do things. But I've also learned not to push, you know, and 
as things can, I met a beautiful woman last night. I'm doing pottery. Um, there's a local pottery here, and she's doing soil carbon. She's got a business around soil carbon, and we've got a mutual friend in central Queensland. So you never mm. kind of know where your next opportunity mm. is, but having conversations and engaging with other people, being curious enables, it creates opportunity. And stepping Dang. up where you see and it's that voice and stepping up, isn't it? That's, that's the theme of, of your conversation with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure um, having this conversation with you today after hearing you speak recently at a conference and North Stradbroke Island for our international uh, listeners is just off the coast of the capital city of Queensland, Brisbane. And it's, it's a beautiful place, an absolutely beautiful place. Uh, next year in 2024, in June, the International Convention for Zonta is in Brisbane. And um, so it's it's nice to be able to have someone from Brisbane speaking with me today, which, of course, is uh, where I spend a lot of my time as well, albeit that I'm in Formba today as we're speaking, Jane, in my house there. So an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Uh, remember, to those are listening today, Jane's book, Slow Clothing, Finding Meaning in What We Wear, is readily available and she's made some lovely reference to uh, some PDFs and some extra reading that we may wish to engage with. So thank you so very, very much, Jane, uh, for giving me and Zonta International your time today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity.